Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Jenny Levine, and this program is brought to you by the Durham County Library. Thank you for attending today's much anticipated program on the book, Classic Restaurants of Durham. It is available here at Durham County Library, as well as your local bookstore and from Amazon. Co-authors Patrick Cullum and Chris Holliday are joining me today to speak about the stories you'll find inside, and if there's time, a bit about their journey bringing this book to life. These two also wrote classic restaurants of Chapel Hill and Orange County. You're welcome to ask questions in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the program. We hope to hear some of your fond remembrances as well. Chris Holliday lives in Durham and is the author of a number of books, including Southern Breads and several on the topic of baseball. He graduated from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and has a master's degree in history from the North Carolina Central University in Durham. Chris has been both patron and employee of area restaurants since his days as a student and is excited to share their stories. For nearly 20 years, Patrick Cullum has worked to preserve and ensure access to historic photographic materials. Since 2007, he has served as visual materials processing archivist for Wilson Special Collections Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In this position, he has had the opportunity to work with millions of unique images depicting subjects and locations across the state. Patrick grew up in Raleigh and is a proud NC State University alumnus. As such, he is especially honored to play a part in preserving and sharing North Carolina's rich photographic history. He currently lives in Raleigh with his family and an assortment of four-legged furry friends. Welcome these esteemed authors. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess I'll, I'll start out. I'm Chris, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jenny, for having us. Um, I'll, we're gonna, I'm going to run a slideshow. I'm going to show some photos of Durham restaurant history, just some interesting stories. I mean, there's so many stories, so many people, so many great things to eat, but um, I'll go through that in a minute. First, I guess I'll talk about how this book came about. And I guess my, my uh, relationship with restaurants in Durham and this area started when I was a freshman at UNC. In 1987, I just happened to walk into a business that uh, supplied coffee to a lot of area re restaurants. They, they roasted the coffee and they just clean coffee, high-end coffee to re nicer restaurants for the most part. And they happened to be looking for a delivery driver. I applied, got the job. And so on Thursdays and Fridays, I had a route that would take me to Durham, Chapel Hill, and even over to Raleigh, just dropping off coffee to all these restaurants and I met all these I mean I got to know all these restaurants through the back door which is really kind of interesting I mean I never ate at Magnolia Grill at the time because I was a poor student but I got to go in there every week and just see the restaurant and get familiar with it and see the chefs and it was really an interesting uh, thing being part of the restaurant industry from that way really as a supplier of part of what they served and even after college I worked there for a while I ended up roasting the coffee but Later, I turned more uh, into a marketing writer and I worked for a couple places. And then in the mid 2010s, I was working for Southern Season in Chapel Hill. And I was working with uh, Marilyn Markle, who was the head of the cooking school there. And a lot of people took cooking classes. I don't know if any of you guys did, but it's a great place to go. And, but Marilyn had all these great recipes. And so part of my job was putting her recipes online. And I was like, she needs to have a cookbook. So. One thing led to another. We ended up doing a cookbook called Southern Breads, and just that was sort of her specialty. And it was a fun book to do, a little bit of history, little stories. And that was the end of that. That was like 2016, I think that came out, the end of 2016. So shortly after that, um, I went back to graduate school. I went to NC Central to get my master's in history. And one of the classes I was taking there at the time uh, was done in conjunction with the staff at Wilson Library at UNC. So different people from that, the Wilson Library staff came and spoke to us about what they did and their jobs. And Patrick Cullum was one of them. He talked about, you know, the photo collections that they had there, the, you know, and the amazing collections they had and what they had access to. And just coincidentally, shortly thereafter, the publisher of that cookbook I'd done contacted me and they were doing a series of uh, restaurant stories from different cities. I think they sent me a sample book to, of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. I think that was it. But anyway, they were looking to do one on this area. And they just asked me if I knew anyone who'd be interested in it. And at the time, I was just like, I'm, I'm in school. I'm too busy. And then the more I thought about it, 
I just thought it would be a really fun project. I mean, restaurants are so important to so many people. They have so many, there's so many great memories associated with them, not just the food. I mean, the food is obviously very important, but the, just what you were doing at the time you went in there, why you went there. Was it a date? Was it, you know, prom night? Was it just, you know, going for ice cream with your dad or whatever? I mean, there were just so many things that people remember from restaurants. Or was it just a great meal, a particular dish you love? You know, you never know. But everyone can pick a restaurant and think of something, even if it's Hardee's. I mean, there's always something. So once I realized that and realized my own connection to restaurants, I thought it would be a fun project to take on myself. So I had just met Patrick, so I contacted him and we started talking about it. And with his you know, access to photos and his knowledge of searching through them, which was super important, we decided to do this. And the publisher originally wanted to do a book on Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, all in one book, which is way, way too big. I mean, that's each has their own story. They're very different. And so we got them to divide it up. And so we did the book on Durham first, and that came out about a year ago. And then, uh, no, less than that, uh, about a year ago. And then we did a book, followed it right after that with a book on Chapel Hill and Orange County, which just includes Carborough and Hillsboro. And so... And it was really fun to do those. We learned a lot, but it was also really strange to do them at this time during the pandemic because it's a horrible time for restaurants and so many of them have closed. Um, you know, they've struggled. Even just yesterday, I heard Crook's Corner is closing in Chapel Hill, or they did close. I mean, that's, that's a shock. I and mean, that's one of the most famous restaurants in the state, if not the entire South. And they just, the pandemic, they couldn't recover from it. So unfortunately, there's been a lot of those stories like that. Nana's in Durham is another one that, that didn't come back. So. But anyway, I will run a slideshow and sort of talk about the history of Durham restaurants and just show a few interesting things. There's so many more, but this will give you a little bit of a, of a taste of it. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and start the show here. So there's the cover of the book. And the, um, you know, the restaurant history of Durham, it, it's not, you think of restaurants having always been around, but really they didn't start until probably the latter half of the 1800s. And even then it was only for cities like New York, probably right around maybe the time of the Civil War. But as late as the 1890s, there were not really any restaurants in Durham. It was a pretty new city for one, but, and it was growing. So as the city grew, restaurants began to appear. Before that time, everyone ate at home. And, but Restaurants were needed as a city group because of workers, really. And they started out, a lot of them, as lunch spots, you know, especially as the tobacco industry grew, the mills grew. And so people couldn't go home for meals all the time. So restaurants popped up all over the city, small ones. And this is an early one. This was Procter & Company on Parish Street. And this is from 1899. And I don't know anything about this restaurant. It didn't last very long. I just thought it was an interesting ad. It's the, probably the earliest thing we came across associated with Durham. And I mentioned tobacco markets. Well, tobacco markets were huge in Durham, obviously. And all of them, all the huge warehouses had their own little places to eat in them because they had to feed the farmers who came there. Farmers would bring their crops and hang out there for maybe three days waiting to sell everything at auction. So they had to eat and this was just a picture. This actually came from the Library of Congress. They have some things online, which are really great. They were taken around 1939 or 40, I believe. And in addition to eating in the, um, the warehouses, there were also restaurants that were, you know, that were built just to really kind of serve the farm farmers that came into town. This was one, Farmer's Cafe. And this one is great. Well, it's interesting because it shows how Durham was at the time, it was segregated. You have the white entrance and the colored entrance and very unfortunate, but that was history of Durham. And well, I'll come back to that in a minute more, but this was just a, a popular restaurant. This was on uh, Mangum Street, I believe, right near downtown. And this is another, just a little bit of change here, show how much Durham has changed. This picture is from around 1940, and this is the American Tobacco Complex, which obviously is still around, which has you know, been revitalized, but much of the rest of this is long gone. And Durham Freeway runs right behind this. You can even see part of the warehouse spaces right here. Those are gone. That's where the, the freeway is. But the restaurant that's important in this picture was um, the cafeteria right here. You can see it. And it uh, was very popular 
and it's in this little corner right here. And this is right today. This is the left field of the Durham Bowls Athletic Park. And this is it right here. This is A.B. Morris Cafeteria. It was a little triangle shaped building right there. And it's just funny to think that that is now part of the ballpark. But this was replaced around 1970 by uh, Nance Cafeteria. The Nance family was very big in restaurants in Durham for a long time. But this building, basically the same shape, but a more modern building became another cafeteria. But Morris Cafeteria was actually, even though it was not, it was really developed to serve people who worked in the American tobacco, Duke students also found it kind of trendy to go sneak in there and eat, even though it really <laughs> it was kind of a different place. But that was, that was an interesting part of it. This was another place that was super popular in Durham, for, especially for lunch, Amos and Andy Hot Dogs. And this was downtown and it actually moved a couple times, but this is his first location. This is on Chapel Hill Street. And I always thought this was interesting because they had an ABC permit, they serve beer there. You don't really think of that with hot dogs, but this place did. But anyone who grew up in Durham in the 50s, 60s will remembers this place. And now this is there now. And I'm gonna do that a few times in this show. I'm gonna show you what, where things are where they were and what's there now. So this is the Marriott and Convention Center. That whole block was torn down that, that housed Amos and Andy, unfortunately. And then another one that was really popular, especially with Duke students, was Anna Maria's Pizza. And in the late 50s, when we think of pizza as being so common now, but pizza was an exotic food in the South, particularly you know in the 50s. It wasn't really anywhere. But the woman, Anna Maria, she was from uh, New Jersey, I believe, of Italian heritage. So she and her husband moved down here and opened a small restaurant. They originally started out in their house, and then uh, they got another space, which had originally been a house as well, and turned it into a small pizza restaurant. The Duke students loved it. It was very popular, and it, it existed from, it was probably the first pizza restaurant in Durham, and there's a story behind that, too. It's uh, the Duke football quarterback, Sonny Jurgensen who was from uh, Wilmington, he uh, found out Anna Maria was from, you know, knew how to make pizza. So he'd heard about it. So he convinced her to make him one. So it was really, that's sort of how it started, you know, the pizza business in Durham, which is, is a really interesting story. But that business has gone to, it, it lasted up to the 80s, I think. And this is that spot right now. And this is Main Street right here on the left. This is Albemarle Street. And so... That is just a parking lot now. Another one that was really a popular place was the Blue Light. And it was sort of a, it had a grill inside and it had a drive-in place where they would serve you at your car outside. And it lasted from the 40s up until very recently, although it changed several times. By the 70s, the restaurant part was gone. It focused more on being a convenience store and then later specialized just in beer and very exotic beers. And it was the place to go if you were a beer drinker. And so that was, it was super popular, but now I don't even have a new picture of this from Google Earth because the, it, Google hasn't kept up with what's there now. There's a huge apartment building there now, Blue Light Living, at least they kept a reference to the original restaurant. This is right in between um, Durham Freeway and uh, 9th Street there. We're right off 9th Street, Durham Freeway and Main Street. And Dillard's was a popular barbecue place. There were two sort of, you know, in the age of segregation, there was there was the black barbecue place and the white barbecue place. The white one was uh, Bullock's. Well, the Dillard family ran their own barbecue place, which was very popular on um, Fayetteville Street. And Sam Dillard was the was the patriarch of that family. His daughter later ran the business, but I could not find a picture of it. But this was a great advertisement, I thought, because he's wearing he's sort of it's making a little bit fun of Colonel Sanders. You know, he's got the white suit on, and then shortly after this ad. Colonel Sanders, I think, sent him a cease and desist letter. And so he couldn't wear the white suit anymore. And so he had a, his next ad following this, which I couldn't find. He has a white suit folded up sitting next to him. And it says, the Colonel may have taken my suit, but my, my sauce still makes chicken taste good. So, but he passed away, I think in the nineties. And then his daughter ran the restaurant. And um, actually anyone who ate at the uh, Durham Bulls Park in the nineties and early two thousands probably knows Dillard's because they supplied the barbecue to the Bulls. But finally, around 2009 or 10, um, his daughter decided to retire and sold the space. And where Dillard's was on Fayetteville Street is now Family Fair. So that is another one that is long gone. But it was around from the 40s up until around 2009 or 10. 
Another one in an important part of Durham that, well, Durham, everyone knows the infamous uh, urban, you know, rehabilitation project or whatever, where half of Durham was unfortunately turned down, especially the Haytai area, the black area of town was, you know, decimated by building a highway through and businesses were shut off. And, and uh, the donut shop was one of those places that uh, opened in the 40s, it was very popular, it was on Pettigrew Street. And this was an ad that was uh, set up for uh, people at what is now North Carolina Central, welcoming alumni in there. And it, it was a great place. It was a really cool, like 40s looking diner place. Look at the jukebox there. It's really a neat place. But that location became this. And this is Pettigrew Street. And I told you before I worked in coffee roasting. Well, that wasn't actually in Carborough where that started. But we later moved right to this building right here on Pettigrew Street which was just nothing. It was a sort of an empty tobacco warehouse, the Venable building. And at the time, and this was all gravel parking lot. And I remember when we would park there, there would always be these sort of like relics in the ground, pieces of rusted metal and bricks. And we had no idea what had actually been there because um, the guys I worked with, none of us were from Durham. And so we didn't really know the history of the Haytai area. And so it's really nice to learn more about that and understand what was there. And the donut shop was like right in here somewhere and then Biltmore Hotel was right next to it, which was sort of a hotel for black travelers. And it had a restaurant in it as well. So this whole business district was, is gone now. And actually this picture was a couple years ago from Google Earth, but they're building a huge building right in this parking lot now. So Durham is changing so quick. And mentioning, you know, restaurants in the Haytai area, this is one that is still around. It's probably the second oldest restaurant in Durham, Chicken Hut, after Bullock's. I believe. And it started out called the Chicken Box and it was on uh, Fayetteville Street, no, Roxborough Street. And when the highway was put through that, this was one of the businesses that was torn down. And so they were forced to move and they did survive. They didn't just shut down. So they moved to Fayetteville Street, South Fayetteville Street, and they changed the name to Chicken Hut. But the business is still around and it has been operating since the uh, 50s, I believe. And so... And this is another one that is a interesting story. It sort of ties into segregation story and just a popular restaurant. And so this was Harvey's Cafeteria. This was on Main Street, right near the intersection with uh, Roxborough, I believe. And it was a popular place. It was just a regular cafeteria where you would go through, you have your list up here on the menu of your meats and your vegetables. And it started in the 50s, I believe, or 40s, probably in the 40s. And the owner was a guy named Harvey Rape. And so he, that's where the name comes from. But it was very segregated. And, you know, you can even see here, they, the black staff was kept in the back, which is interesting, though, because their advertisements, their chef is right at, featured in the advertisements, even though it was a segregated place. And in the 19, early 60s, Durham was trying to figure out you know, how to deal with segregation in restaurants. There became more and more protest. And the mayor of Durham, who was pretty progressive, uh, Wentz Graberic, he was trying to pull together a task force from different restaurant people to come up with a solution for this. And he enlisted Harvey Rape from Harvey's Cafeteria because he knew that Harvey was the most opposed to desegregation of everyone. And finally, he convinced him. And I think Mayor Graberic decided that if he could convince uh, Harvey Rape that he can convince anyone. And it was successful. And Harvey Rape did sort of change his, his views and he did desegregate, you know, right around the time of the Civil Rights Act. I think a little before the Civil Rights Act was enacted, 1963. So, but Durham actually had another uh, interesting story with the Durham mayor before Graberic was a guy named Mutt Evans was mayor for several terms. And he was actually Jewish, which was pretty uncommon in the South at that time too. But he owned, or his family owned a department store called Evans United Department Store, I believe. It was right there on Main Street. Uh, I think it's a parking lot now, right? Sort of at five, or the five forks, five corners right there. And anyway, he had a lunch counter in there and he was ordered by a judge to, to segregate it because he wasn't, he wasn't enforcing that at the time. This was in the fifties. And so he decided that he argued with the judge that that only applied if customers were seated. So he decided that the way around that was just take out the seats. And so he took out all the stools and you had to stand 
but he, he wasn't forced to desegregate because he was never segregated at that point. Everyone who could go in there and order at the counter and just stand and eat with their elbows on the counter. So that was just kind of an interesting way around it. But that, he was the first of Durham's really progressive mayors, which was kind of an interesting story all in its own. But anyway, Harvey's Cafeteria, this is the site now. It was torn down in the early 70s, and it was replaced by this building. It's sort of a strange 70s creation here. And this is, was a great restaurant that was really popular with Duke students. It was called the Ivy Room, and it was on, on well, there's the address, 1004 West Main Street. And it was sort of a deli, uh, had a sort of a New York style deli. Had, they sold foods and gifts in there, and it was a really unique place. And they also sold chicken in the rough, which was a, a, which something I was not familiar with. It was a franchise meal that you could sell that it came with potatoes and fries and uh, like sort of a bucket, sort of like Kentucky Fried Chicken, but it was different. And, um, but this guy's name was Percy Poole and he owned it, he ran the restaurant and it was super popular up until around the eighties. I think it closed around 1985 finally. And that's where it was. And that building is still there. It's, it was, it's right here in the corner, Albemarle. I showed you Anna Maria's pizza before that was right back here behind this. And um, this building right here is another interesting story. It's the Federal now, but it was um, uh, the subway for a long time. And then it became Bull City Subs because they had a, a copyright battle with the um, subway, the chain. But the subway, the chain had to pay them to be able to use the name subway in Durham. So that's an interesting story there in its own. Little Acorn was probably one of the most popular restaurants in the city from the 40s perhaps the 30s, I can't remember exactly, up until the 70s when the owner passed away. But it was on Rigsby Street. And it was popular with people who were going to the uh, tobacco warehouses because it was just down the street, but also with regular citizens of the city. And it was, you know, barbecue, Brunswick stew, steaks, you, you know, your basic Southern fare. And so it was, it was a very popular place and a big place too. And now that location is just this. It's sort of a nondescript building. I don't even really know what this is. It's some kind of storage facility, maybe. It's right above um, Full Steam Brewery. If you look at this picture, you can still see the sidewalk and the two entrances for uh, cars where they would go into Little Acorn. But it was a very popular place. And then the Oriental was the first Chinese restaurant in Durham and as far as I can tell, the second Chinese restaurant in North Carolina, there was one in Charlotte that was older, but it opened in 1938, and Chinese food was very exotic in Durham. I mean, it, pretty much in Durham, it, until pizza came about, everyone ate the exact same thing in Durham. Black or white, you ate barbecue, you ate, you know, Brunswick stew, you ate steaks, hamburgers. It, it was nothing too uh, varied. It was a pretty common meals, but the Oriental did you know, offer Chinese food. They also offered American food, as they point out here, for those who are not brave enough to try the Chinese food. And it was an interesting place, too, because they, even though they were owned by a Chinese family, all the wait staff were, were white women, just because they made the customers more comfortable, I guess. But it was a very popular place for many years, over 30 years. In the late 60s, it finally closed. And that location it's actually not even an address anymore. It's on Parish Street. It's just this little parking lot between two buildings. So, but that that business had a very important role in you know bringing new flavors to Durham. This is another uh, important restaurant. This was Lincoln Cafe. This was owned by Mike Galifianakis of the Galifianakis family. His brother was Nick, who was a, a congressman from North Carolina. But this is right behind the Crest Building, which is still there and. This uh, building, it's right near uh, the train tracks or right below this, but this actually was, it served more of a black clientele from what I can tell. And it, uh, unfortunately this was another victim of urban development. They tore down a lot of this area. And so that's it now, it's just a little parking lot. And I think actually the train station, the original Durham train station from not wrong was right over here on the other side and it was a great building another victim of uh, urban development in the you know late 60s early 70s and uh, this is the palms and like like a lincoln cafe it was also owned by family of greek immigrants but greek food was 
viewed as too exotic for the normal American, especially Southern taste. So Greek families who were involved in restaurants, and there were quite a few, served just traditional American fare. So the Lincoln Cafe was one, and then the Palms was another one. It opened in the, four, no, I think it actually opened in the 20s. It was around for a long, long time. And I'm not even sure what year this postcard is from, but at that point it had never closed for 19 years. But the Palms finally, it was sold in the late 70s. It, it was open for a few more years and it finally closed in the early 80s. And it was supposedly the place in Durham where everyone went to, uh, to meet and to do business and the judges went there and lawyers and it was, it was the place to be seen in downtown Durham. And that location is right here on Chapel Hill Street. It's not much there now, it's just, it's a business. But if you look right here on the ground in front of the door, it still says Palms and it's been there, you know, since the 60s at least, this part has been. So there are little bits of Durham restaurant history tucked away that are still there. And certain, you know, buildings where something else became a restaurant and became something else again. And that, you know, that's just, how a lot of this building history goes, but certain addresses have always sort of been a restaurant. And this is one, 401 East Chapel Hill Street. It's been many, many restaurants and it was r &M Cafe. This is from the forties, I think. And then it became Center Luncheonette. This is in the sixties. And then now that address is Rue Claire. That's just always been a, a restaurant spot there in Durham for many years. Sal and the Fox was a hugely popular restaurant in Durham. This was on um, Hillsborough Road going towards, uh, towards Orange County. And at the time, it was sort of out in the country. And this was started by a guy named Charles Haynes, who was a Duke alumni. And he had been in the military in World War II. He'd actually been injured in Italy. And he came back, recovered, and decided he was going to go into the restaurant business. And his family owned a horse farm in that area. So that's where he sort of got the uh, horse-related theme to the restaurant. They opened this huge steakhouse. If you look right here on my left, that's a giant pile of oyster shells, which they would throw out there. But this was a very popular place. It was also sort of a trendy place to take your date, a uh, fancy steakhouse kind of thing, which was sort of the pinnacle of dining in Durham, you know, for many years before the, sort of the new wave of uh, Southern cuisine came about, Magnolia Grill and all that started in the, you know, in the 80s. But in the 60s, 50s, and even the 70s, um, Sal and the Fox was, the, was sort of the place to go. This is a picture of India, this is from the, uh, probably around 1980, late 70s. And it's interesting too, because this restaurant was sort of, at the time, was sort of at the very edge of Durham. So they have pennants here on the right. There's a Duke pennant and a UNC pennant. So they tried to attract people from both areas. And that business is now this, it's O'Reilly Auto Parts. And it's really interesting that that's just, that huge part of Durham history is just an auto parts store now. But when I first came to this area that uh, Silent Fox had changed, it became, um, it was sort of half, it was Italian garden on one side and a steakhouse on the other side. It sort of been two restaurants were put into that one building, you know, in the eighties and nineties, that's how it operated. And then another place that was sort of drew from Chapel Hill and Durham was called Turnage's Barbecue, and this was on Maureen Road. And it was just sort of a nondescript building. Um, I don't even know what this group is. It's some kind of civic group was meeting there, but it was a big, biz big building. And lots of groups went there from UNC, from Duke, from the hospitals. They would all meet there. But it was just traditional, you know, Southern barbecue. They would smoke the barbecue outside over the pits. Very popular. It started by a guy named Turnage who opened it. It was very small. He only opened a couple days a week. And then uh, finally, after the war, he sold it to one of his employees. And that employee kept the name Turnage's and expanded it, became more and more popular. And it became very popular with Duke students, surprisingly, for uh, jazz nights. So they brought in people, you know, bands to play, and the students would come and dance. So it's strange to think of a uh, Southern barbecue and jazz, but that was a very popular thing there at Turnage's. And that location, I couldn't find a good picture of what's there now, but it's now a veterinary clinic. But before that, uh, it was Nance Seafood. After Turnage's closed down around 1970, uh, the Nance family who owned that cafeteria I mentioned earlier, they took it over and became Nance Seafood, which was very popular in its own right in the 70s and early 80s. 
And this was another one that I just found this menu. I thought it was kind of funny. Tops Drive In. This was on a on a Main Street near Ninth, and that was a popular place for people to go in the '50s and '60s. And uh, you can get the big famous sirloiner burger for sixty cents. But uh, that was a popular place people probably remember. And actually, Tops and Turnages I just showed they were two restaurants that uh, voluntarily desegregated before the Civil Rights Act. So that was just, that's an interesting fact I came across. And chain restaurants, you know, are not, you don't really think of them as being so unique. I mean, they're obviously not unique, but so important to a city's dining history, but they all played their role. And this is Hardee's at Forest Hills. And it was one of the first Hardee's in North Carolina. It opened in 1964. I'm not exactly what, sure what number Hardee's it is, but I think it was in the first 10 that opened in the state. It started in um, Greenville and Rocky Mount areas and then moved here. But this was a popular place. It was interesting architecture, if nothing else. But I'm not sure what year it closed, uh, but that location is now somewhere right around here. I think it was this spot, but it's hard to tell because the addresses have changed a little bit right there. And Mentioning fast food, I think the oldest fast food restaurant in Durham, it's still in its original location, is um, Church's Chicken on North Miami Boulevard. I think it's been there since the 78, I believe. So, and then lastly, I'm going to show a couple of little restaurants that are interesting that were chains, but they were also patented designs, which is kind of a funny thing to think of, but like a lot of restaurants want to have their, you know, unique look. And these were uh, sort of Southern chains. I mean, Donut Dinette was based in Charlotte, I believe. And uh, this was um, Shrimp Boats, which is based in Georgia. And Donut Dinette was here in the 50s and 60s, and it, it, it closed. But uh, Shrimp Boats was here for years and years. It opened around 1970 in Durham, I think, and it finally closed in the late 2010s or mid 2010s. But shrimp, I mean, um, Donut Dinette was right here in this, this address. And I showed you uh, Ivy Room before a while ago, and that was right next door, right over here to the right. And I think Donut Dinette might have been right here where this driveway is. But it was, it was interesting. It was sort of on the chrome, you know, aluminum-sided buildings. And then uh, Shrimp Boats, this building still there, and that is now Saltbox uh, Seafood Joint. It's one of the more popular restaurants in Durham. And so that, I believe, is my last slide, just to give you a taste of Durham restaurants and sort of show you a few of the interesting places and a few of the interesting people, and there's so many more. But um, I'll leave it right there, and I'll let Patrick talk a little bit about where these pictures came from and, and what he does, because that's really important to any kind of research or anyone looking to learn more about local history. So, Patrick. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Chris. Um, and um, thanks, thanks to Durham Public Library for having us here. Um, uh, folks, yeah, as, as Jenny mentioned earlier, my name is Patrick Collum. Um, I'm here today as a researcher. Uh, I helped write this book with Chris. Um, we met, as he said, at, at, uh, when he was doing some coursework at uh, Wilson Library. And we found, you know, we've been talking about uh, doing the possibility of doing three books on the area that with um, my knowledge of Raleigh and his knowledge of Chapel Hill and by being there and knowing a little bit about Chapel Hill. And then together we were able to really put together a, a really large list. This is a really cold list of, I mean, we had a lot more names in here and to, to try to fit them all in here was a challenge. Um, so what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was uh, I'll talk about, of course, the book, but um, I want all of you to think about uh, yourself as a researcher, because the collection that I'm going to really highlight has to do with Durham and it has to do with Durham history. Um, and it's bigger than, than the restaurants. So I'll start sharing my screen here. And so I'm gonna start uh, by talking uh, a little bit about um, one of the main collections that I used in, in, in finding images for the book, and that's the uh, Durham Morning Herald collection. Um, these are the negatives uh, created by the newspaper for, for over 40 years. Um, so this is just one resource that we use. Um, the types of collections that we used while we were doing research for this book varied. Um, we used uh, resources. Uh, I'm at UNC Chapel Hill, as was mentioned in my uh, bio there. So I have a lot of insight into the collections there, but we also worked with the Durham Public Library and the City Museum. 
um, sources, Open Durham, um, you know, some, some great sources online, but the images mainly come from local publications, and that's going to be things like newspapers, cities, directories, and I'll talk a little bit about how you as researchers can find these things. Um, residents who are also photographers, people like Bill Bamberger um, or people like Jerome Fryer, these are just citizens who were also photographers who, um, you know, different places have some of their collections. And then Chris was also to make uh, also able to make a lot of connections with the families and owners of some of these places, and they have materials that nobody else has. Um, so, but for the most part, the resources, the images that you see in the book are available to you, uh, the public. Um, and, you know, one of the, the main resources that I use, because of the very subject, is, is the Durham Herald, um, I call it the Darryl, Durham Herald Photo Collection, because it has a longer name. It's the Durham Herald Corporation Newspaper Photograph Collection. Um, and it is housed at uh, the uh, Wilson Special Collections Library at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, it is open to the public. Um, it is available for use. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why it might be of interest to people looking for other things other than restaurants. Um, I have a up on the screen, you can see, you can go to the UNC library page and you can search through the catalog and pull up the finding aid. And I'll talk a little bit about what a finding aid is and um, how you use that to get through the collection. You can also just Google Durham Herald Company uh, newspaper photograph collection Wilson Library. It'll be in the top five things that pop up. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some resources that you can get at the Durham Public Library and through online resources uh, like the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. Um, these are places that have, uh, through the Durham Public Library, you have access to the Durham Morning Herald and the Durham Sun and the I'll talk a little bit about, about the papers that are owned by the company um, that created these images. But um, through the library, you have resources that will allow you to get to keyword searchable versions of the newspaper. And then you can use that information to use the collection that's at UNC um, to help find some images. Um, I also have some images up here of some newspaper indexes, which are some very, very useful objects that are now available online. Um, and those are available to you as well through your library and digital NC. So what is in this collection, this Durham Herald photograph collection? So um, you have to think back uh, a little bit um, to how um, newspapers traditionally used to work. I'm even talking, you know, in, in a couple decades ago, um, they still work in similar ways, but um, think pre-internet, uh, think uh, pre-cell phone, uh, a photographer being sent out by a newspaper to take pictures and they would be given a printout uh, or a handwritten tickets that just said show up here at nine o'clock and take pictures at city hall of the mayor shaking hands with so-and-so then go to the flower show then go to the pet store and uh, the pet show and uh, if you run across anything on your way take pictures of that so of all those images that these staff photographers working for these newspapers took um some of those images ended up in the paper most of them didn't um so you also have to think so if you see a picture in the paper there might be an alternate view if there's a picture, I mean, a story in the paper and there's no picture, there may be a picture. There may even be pictures of things that they didn't even put in the paper. That's why this is such a great collection. So it has everything that appeared in the paper, things that might not have appeared in the paper, notable events, you have national politics, local politics, um, you have people just living day-to-day -day lives. I mentioned, or it was mentioned in my opening that I grew up in uh, Raleigh uh, in the, uh, in, in the 80s and 90s, um, I'm in this collection. I found pictures of myself. I'm in North Raleigh and the newspaper was covering sports in North Raleigh and covering events of interest. Um, when you think of, especially around the pre-internet time or when the internet was first out and it isn't what it is now, you know, the newspapers knew that they were gonna be competing with this source. So they kind of took pictures of everything in case they might run a story. So the collection contains really three newspapers, the Durham Morning Herald, Durham Sun, and the Herald Sun. It's about 2 million images, I think. Um, I say that because I actually was in on the acquisition and bringing the materials to the library. Um, so these are all kind of guesstimates, but it's over 50 people taking pictures. Um, and we have a way to get you to all of it. Just to give some background, when these negatives were in the wild, um, that's what I like to say, um, this is what 2 million images look like. Um, these walls of cabinets went around uh, the library inside of where the Durham Morning Herald had them stored for many years. Um, in the back of the images, you can see there's bins here in the wall. 
These are bins full of photographic prints that the reference librarians put together. Um, and these drawers are all full of envelopes that have stacks of negatives inside them. And about 99% of them have something written on them. So I show these pictures to give some background on how, how do you how do you organize this and how do you make this so this is usable? And how was I as a researcher able to get into this large amount of stuff and find what I was looking for? So uh, when the collection came to UNC, uh, this collection had the, the benefit of actually being used by the newspaper, even though it had been uh, in an abandoned building for a while. Um, up until several years before that, it had been used. So it had some order to it. Um, and I preserved that order as we processed it. So there are, are two major breaks in the collection. There's a run of negatives. And those are basically, if you think of it as 39 photographers, 39 photographers who work, those are in cron order. So we took all that stuff out of those shelves and put them in little shoebox sized boxes and numbered them. So each series represents a photographer and those are in cron order. So it's basically everything that photographer A took on this day, um, the title make correspond to something that's easily findable in the paper. Um, it might also just um, be something that they took that never made it in the paper. So that's why this collection ends up being really kind of a catch-all. If you know when something happened and you think the newspaper might have taken it, this collection allows you to find the photographers who were on staff during that time period and show you what at least is in the collection for what they took during that time. The second series in the collection are photographs grouped by subject. And there are 14 series here. And these are ones that were grouped and put together by the newspaper staff. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The first series, as I mentioned, lists the photographers. So in each one of these uh, series, there is a photographer's name, the date that they started, and the date they stopped. Um, I have actually a visualization that I, I, I think I will share because it actually shows um, how this works and how it might affect research. Um, let me just get that pulled up. I'm sorry. Um, so each one of those series that I was just showing represents a photographer. So in this chart that I made, this timeline shows 1950 through 2000. And each one of these lines shows when each one of these photographers was on staff. So you can see some of these folks were here for a really long time. Charles Cooper was there for you know, 40 years. Harold Moore, which the library has several books by, by Mr. Moore, he's a prolific photographer, had an um, amazing body of work. Uh, he was there for over 40, 45 years. So if you're looking for things in the collection and it was taken before 1950, it's pretty safe that it's gonna be here. Where this takes a little bit of research is when you end up with four or five people on staff and the image didn't appear in the paper. You might have to do a little bit of digging. Um, so I just show this to show how you know, when we get into the 80s and 90s, they're really changing, uh, changing photographers a lot. Um, so uh, I brought that up for that. Um, almost all of the enclosures in this series are labeled with a date uh, and some sort of title that, that talks about what, what's going on in the image. The second group of materials that I talked about are materials that are grouped together by the Herald staff. So they went through and they pulled together things and, and this says all of the negatives with quotations around it because it's not all of the negatives. Likely they hired an intern and asked them to go through all those 39 series and pull out all the ACC games they could find. So it's possible that they missed one in the ACC series that's still in there. Or same thing, uh, Durham Bulls baseball, uh, this series here is pretty comprehensive. It has just about every game and every team from 1945 to 1995, but it's possible that Charles Cooper took some pictures of, um, in, uh, of uh, you know, the barbecue stand or some kids playing out front or something that they didn't pull. So it's always worth looking back in into that. Um, so they did this for things that were of high use, high interest, things that they didn't want to have to pull over and over again. Um, of, of note, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment or two, these last two series here are those prints that I mentioned being in the bins on the wall in the back. These are prints that were called by the, uh, by the staff 
in the newspaper um, that have names of important people and subjects and things like that. So they're copy prints that have already been pulled. It's not comprehensive, but then when you flip them over, it'll be stamped with the photographer's name and the date. You can go to the series of negatives and there may be like 39 images and you've just seen one. That's the thing to keep in mind with any pictures in the newspaper. That's one of likely at least five or six. Um, so there's going to be more. Um, so really quickly, I just want to talk about the levels of description you will see. As I mentioned earlier, everything in the collection has a box level. So if you think that there's a picture taken by Charles Cooper and it was taken between October 1955 and April 56, we can get you the box. And you can look through it. And most of these, as I said, 99% of them have something written on it and a date. So do your own research, you know, that kind of thing. But we can get you to the box. And as I mentioned, when there's two or three photographers, you may have to, if it's April 1965, there might be three photographers who are on staff, but we can pull those boxes for you. They can get those boxes pulled. Now for about 100,000 enclosures, those envelopes I showed in the pictures, we have transcribed those. So there are about 100,000 enclosures in there where we've gone through and put this in. Whoops, sorry. And that's really useful because you can keyword search it. Um, for the oldest stuff, we've done this for the materials 1945 through roughly 1970, and we've rehoused all of the acetate materials, which are the really old uh, photographic materials, the pre-polyester that are really deteriorating and um, need, need a little special care. Um, but it's this series of stuff, the 100,000 or so enclosures that I was able to use or you could use to just keyword search. So and for this instance, I was looking for an image related to the Green Candle restaurant. So I just searched the guide, keyword searched it for Green Candle, found this, I was able to pull the enclosure, which you can see here. Um, then we got it scanned and then boom, it's in the book. Um, this is the identifier. This just means that it's been processed and it's a lot easier for the, uh, the digital production center to scan because um, it has a number. There are other resources that you can use to help you find things in the newspaper. Um, there are these print indexes, which are a wonderful resource. These are available through the Durham Public Library. They're also available uh, through the digital, the NC Digital Heritage Center. They're online uh, and you can OCR them. But basically these are, uh, I'll say they're very expensive. They cost a lot of money to make, um, but basically what they would do is hire um, librarians and uh, people who run staff at the newspaper to um, basically catalog subjects. So this was the R section for 1970 to 1981. You can see here there's something about Harvey's is ready for Durham. Uh, you see some other things. I was interested in finding something about the Bullock's restaurant. So here I could see Bullock's restaurant recipe or, uh, for the restaurant. It has the date. It has the paper that it was in. It has the section and then it says illustration. That may mean that there's an image. I always look anyway because that they didn't always put that down. Um, but what you can do is use those guides to, here I'm looking at Newsbank, um, that's what we have at UNC, but you can search the Durham Morning Herald um, holdings online to the, the Durham Public Library site. Um, you can keyword search, you can search by date. In this instance, I was able to look for this June 29th date. Um, I found the article that I was looking for. I can see down here in the bottom corner, it was taken by Harold Moore. Um, I could take that information, go to the finding aid, uh, find the box of Harold Moore negatives that would have that in there. Um, in this instance, I was actually able to find a print in the print series. So uh, I was able to get the print in there. But then again, on the back, it says Harold Moore and it has the date. So, and there were other shots, but I went with Mr. Moore's choice because usually these are the ones that they selected because um, it's the frame that they marked on the roll. So uh, we ended up going with that one. Um, those print series that I mentioned at the end are really great because they're already prints, they're not negative, you don't have to put them on a light table, you can hold them up, you can see what you get. Um, this one uh, that I, this example I pulled out, you know, as I mentioned, I'm kind of a nobody from, from Raleigh, um, but you know, this is my high school, I know everybody who's in this picture. Um, they covered everything really from, you know, the central part of North Carolina, they have high school sports, they have things you wouldn't even think of. I found I found uh, Boy Scout events I was at, um, church events, school events, things that, you know, the Durham paper was covering because, you know, they did have a Raleigh, they had a North Raleigh um, uh, branch, they had a North Raleigh section, they had a Chapel Hill section. So this collection is bigger than you think um, as far as what's there. And again, all of this description that's in here is just what other people have said and is just waiting. You know, most of this restaurant stuff 
we found. A lot of these pictures were corner of Mangum Street and so-and-so, you know, car wreck. And I'm just looking for the hot dog stand in the back. I don't really care about the car wreck, um, that kind of thing. So um, that's another part of this uh, collection that can be used. And, you know, there's lots of information there. I have the, the link to the finding aid there. Um, and the librarians at the Durham Public Library have, we, they have lots of scans from these materials. They know where this, how to find this stuff. They know how to get in touch with UNC. And same thing at UNC Chapel Hill. The librarians are there to help. Um, and and um, it's a great resource. And, and that's, that's what I have about, about that. That is great. Thank you so much. It's fascinating. A ton of information. And I'm sure there are research rabbit holes. You have to hold yourself back from going down. Um, so much interesting material. Uh, I was hoping the people in the audience, if you would type in the chat, the oldest Durham restaurant that you remember going to. Mine was Daryl's uh, out there on 15501. I didn't, I didn't even, I had the name wrong. It's like Daryl's 1890 or something like that. Um, but that was one of my oldest Durham memories along with the uh, Orange Julius at uh, South Square Mall. Um, but that brought up a point for me. Um, so the salt box restaurant is using a patented design. Should be worried for them, or has that patent, you know, finally? Oh yeah, I mean that 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 whole chain is long gone. So you know, I Thanks actually printed out a big um, copy of that patent on a big sheet, and I gave it to Ricky Moore, who owns uh, Salt Box. He thought it was really neat. So. <laughs> okay, good because I didn't want anything to happen to that place. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was thinking, Patrick, while you were going through all those materials, do you have to use uh, special gloves or anything when you're looking at these these ancient photographs? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the the negatives, most of the materials um, are need to be used in, in the reading room or the light room. Yes, you would wear gloves on those. Uh, but um, you know, they would. As soon as something, one of the great things about that collection, as soon as something gets requested, the images are uploaded and put online. So as soon as something's digitized out of there, the workflow is to get it, get it in online. That was one question from the Q&A from Joan. Is there a plan to digitize the images? So I guess everything from the book has been digitized and available? Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I can't speak for my uh, colleagues at the Digital Production Center, but I can, I can say that... Um, it's the logistics of scanning it all are, are, are pretty low. It would be pretty low that that would happen just because, I mean, at my guesstimate, there's about 3 million images and those are, you know, frames of film um, and even just the storage to store all of that and the decisions over, you know, what to scan. So we're, it's, it's always a balance, I think, of trying to figure out what the institution thinks people want to see, what people want to see and then you know what you need to scan to preserve because we do have some material in here that's old enough that um, you know if it's deteriorating taking a digital image of it is, is going to be the, 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 the saving grace for it. I'm glad you mentioned the um, that you this is a cold list of restaurants it's not complete because I'm sure you feel like you could have written this book forever uh -huh. and just come up with more and more and more. Uh, so people have written in the chat, um, Ivy Room and Anna Maria's. Yep. Um, it's a freshman Duke experience. Bacchus's? Yeah, there was Bacchus, I mean, George's Bacchus is a huge person in uh, restaurant history in Durham and Chapel Hill both and Raleigh. He's, he's opened so many restaurants over the years um, in all the cities. I mean, Taverna Nico's in Durham and then, I mean, lot, lots of other ones. And so... Here's I one I have. Someone, someone mentioned the, the uh, College Inn as a, one of their memories. That's a, that was a great, that's in the book too. That was on Fayetteville Street that sort of catered to students at Central. So that was a very popular place too. And I remember hearing about the No Bookstore. Does that count as a restaurant? What would you? I think that's where, is that what College Inn became? I don't know, but that's right there in that same little area if it's not, yeah. Um, before we were the program, we were talking about uh, favorite meals that you all had experienced on this journey. And I know that's an impossible question because there are so many good ones. Um, I was wondering if you had a top five um, restaurant that, you know, is no longer here. So, so we're not, you know, hurting anyone's feelings. But, uh, is there uh, one you could bring back? In Durham, uh, I was trying to think. I mean, the, the, 
obviously Magnolia is probably the, one of the most famous restaurants in Durham. I mean, I wouldn't say that's my favorite meal or anything, but that was a very important one for Durham that's not here because it sort of set the stage for Durham becoming a more of a food destination, sort of expanding the, the culinary offerings. Um, but, but personally, I mean, that's a hard one. I mean, I did go to a few places when we first started reaching this, researching it before the pandemic. Like I went to, um, one I remember off the top of my head was the Palace International. I hadn't been there in years and I went there again. And that, that's neat because it's sort of a different uh, African cuisine. And then uh, somewhere else, uh, there's so many. They all start running together. That's, that's I, miss, I miss Wimpy's. <laughs> Which one? Wimpy's. Yeah, yeah Wimpy's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did go there too. Yeah, that was that was a good one too. That's gone now, but that was one I hadn't, I hadn't been to in, in a long time. And yeah, it was exactly the same. It seemed. Yeah, <laughs> Except I don't yeah. think people were smoking inside. That was about the only difference. <laughs> we have such a powerful connection with food and memories. And as you were saying, you know, where was your, you know, first date? Your first, mine was Spanky's. Uh, I've forgotten about that place. Uh, it was yeah. there a long time yeah. over in Chapel Hill. Yeah. Um, and you had some great contributors to this uh, this book. And um, yeah, that's one thing I tried since memories were such an important part of it. I just talked to different people and, you know, and other people who might have had photos or knew someone who might be a great person to talk to. Sort of like Andre Van, the, the archivist at Central. He knew some people and, you know, he was a good person to talk with. And then there were others like John Boy, whose family owned the Blue Light. You know, he had some photos. And so there's, there's a lot of different people that were helpful. But like we mentioned earlier before the broadcast, it's like photos are a little more difficult to find than they are. Uh, like nowadays, everyone takes a photo of everything with their cell phone. But before probably the 2000s, that, it just wasn't as common. I mean, who took a picture of food in a restaurant? It was not a common thing. So it's, it's, it's nice that there are those uh, newspaper photographers who did cover a lot of events and restaurants and other, uh, many other, every other aspect of local history and life they took a picture of. So I could certainly remember what the Spanakopita at uh, Taverna Nikos look like yeah. uh, without having to, to rely on a, a picture. Um, yeah. It comes comes back um, <laughs> visibly, and I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have um, any special memories that didn't end up in the book? I mean, there's you know these contacts and these stories people tell. Um, anything special, a special moment that you wanted to share? We've got some. I mean, not not like a personal memory I can think of. I mean, I do have some from Chapel Hill more because I went to school there and they were not associated with working just like, like you said, a first date or just going there with friends or whatever. But Durham, and mainly it's from my days, you know, delivering coffee there and things. And then I love just finding out about places that were long gone, after, you know, before I came around. That was really interesting too. So there's just so many stories and it's how it has the city has changed. I mean, in 2013, Durham was voted like the tastiest city in the South or something by Southern Living. I mean, that's amazing. You know, so there's just everything here now and it has changed so much. And that's really interesting just to follow that story. And so. I'm getting chills from uh, Joanne who wrote that her first date was at Anna Maria's. A oh, dollar wow. fifteen for meatballs, I think is what it says. And later, uh, dinner at Saddle and Fox, where yep. she got diamond earrings. I wow. Mean, just... Yeah, Anna Maria's was famous. They had a bunch of like comic books in there. And everyone used to mention that, that they had people would just read the comic books that the guy, the owner had sitting around. And his name was Bat. They also, that was a nickname of the place, Bat. It was Bat, Bartholomew, I think, and Anna Maria. That was the couple that owned it. So that was... It was an interesting place. I wish I'd been able to go there, but I think it closed in maybe 86, maybe something like that. I found it interesting to see how so many of the same families continued or tried something new um, and then even like branched out to other cities. Um, yeah. and, and it's been, been interesting to, to see that. I just, you don't, yeah, like Chris was saying, you know, often you don't know the owner's name because it's not always, you know, Harry's Grill. It's it's it may be, you know, something else. And to see that some of these people uh, try it again and again, and then finally got it, or or, or you know, uh, like uh, work together, you know, like with the Nance and the, uh, the the other family passing a property or something like that. Uh, it was neat to see that. 
I'm so sorry we're running out of time. We have some great questions that I'm not going to be able to get to. I apologize. There's some great information in the chat about the Coco Jazz Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to be sure to thank you guys for coming today and sharing all this great information. And, and I forgot to thank the Museum of Durham History who helped uh, promote this program. And I'm putting in the chat my email address. Uh, we did record this program. If you'd like uh, an email uh, when it's ready and a link, and if you're not already on my list, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, any final thoughts from you guys? You asked before the, sh the broadcast about why we called it classic restaurants, and that the, the defining factor was sort of a 20-year existence. So okay. restaurants that uh, either were around 20 years or have are, been around 20 years and are still there, so there's a lot of other places we mentioned that did not make that, but those are the ones that fall into the main uh, category or the ones that had a 20 year lifespan, which is a huge deal in restaurant industry because that's a very hard industry to survive in, so. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I hope you all get the book, Classic Restaurants of Durham and check out the other book, Classic, Res Classic Restaurants of Chapel Hill and Orange County. So much good reading and and plan yourself a nice meal and go out and support some of these restaurants. <laughs> Definitely support local restaurants. They need yes. your help right now. So thank you. wonderful. Well, thank you guys. And thank you all for joining us today. I yeah. uh, hope you have a great one. Take Thanks. care. Bye.